Dr. Alan Sadovnik is with us from what Rutgers University, specifically the School of Public Affairs. And he specializes in urban education and extremely well qualified to be able to talk to us about this part of uh, today's talk. So please join me in wel welcoming Alan Sadovnik. Let me, for I, I'm going to stand behind here most of the time. I really hate podiums. But if I stand here, I have to look back at one of the PowerPoint screens, and then I'm not looking at you. So I'd rather be behind a podium and be able to have eye contact than spend the time with having you look at the back of my neck. Uh, OK, let me just begin by telling you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to show you numbers like this. With, sub, with headings that say findings of fixed portions of multi-level regression predicting change in test score performance between 2009 and 10 on NJASC math and LAL assessments. I'm not going to show you distributions of school and teacher effects models. I'm not going to show you scatter points about the relationship between school level estimates, selected school and teacher variables. Uh, why did I just tell you what I'm not going to do? Why did I show you those pretty non-comprehensible, unless you're an econometric expert, uh, my wanting to look smart? Ah, oh, come on, it's not that hard. You're not telling us that, they will listen to you. Ah, right. <laughs> Okay, any other reason? We don't care about it. <laughs> well, you might have to care about it, unfortunately. Uh, the reason I'm showing it to you, and I'm doing what Art said I shouldn't be doing, but I only have less than an hour telling you what you should be figuring out yourself, is that these are the quantitative measures, equations, that are at the center of the policy debates right now about the evaluation of teachers, about value-added models of teacher evaluations, all of the things that, as I will argue, have no room in those for the kinds of nuanced qualitative observations that you just spent a good deal of time talking about. So that while I will not go into any detail, because frankly, I don't understand a lot of it, I leave it to my colleagues in the economics departments to explain them to me. Uh, and that's, I mean, I'm a social scientist. I'm a sociologist by training. I know a lot of statistics. And the fact that I have no idea what these things mean, especially when they start doing these long prediction equations, tells you how complicated this is and how difficult it is, as I will argue, to use these things as administrators. OK, uh, as Jay said, uh, I'm, in addition to uh, what he introduced me uh, as, I'm the co-director of the Institute of Education Law and on Education Law and Policy at Rutgers Newark, which, as many of you know, is a partner uh, with FEA on Legal One. And I am the co-director of the Newark Schools Research Collaborative, a collaborative with the Newark Public Schools to do research on issues that are affecting school quality and student achievement in Newark. And I'm going to, going to use Newark a bit today only because of it. You're following the Star Ledger and the record on any daily basis, you know how controversial Newark has become in the context both of Governor Christie's education agenda and Mayor Booker's education agenda, which happened to coincide. And that the governor sees Newark right now as a testing ground, as a laboratory for the kinds of reforms that he's pushing, and perhaps most importantly, reforms related to teacher quality. So I'm, I'll use Newark a little bit, but I'm really going to extrapolate from that to talk about 
districts throughout New Jersey. Okay. I want to start with, because much of what's going on nationally has come out of a debate about the achievement gap that is about primarily urban and rural schools less than affluent suburban schools although if you look at the 2010 census in New Jersey you see what sociologists are calling the urbanization of suburbia that is large numbers of immigrant groups moving out of cities into kind of suburban ring towns uh, places like Elizabeth and Edison just, you know, 100% plus increases in immigrant populations. Uh, so the days of making these distinction between urban and suburban or rural and suburban are really fast becoming a thing of the past. That is, in a sense, all of our districts in New Jersey and throughout most of the Northeast are becoming urbanized to the extent that teachers and administrators, if they don't face now, will face in the coming years many of the issues related to what was once specific to urban districts. So in a sense, the whole question of how to reduce the achievement gap between more affluent students and less affluent students between different ethnic, race, gender groups uh, has been certainly a part of educational policy since 1983, uh, since a nation at risk, and I'm not going to go through the whole iteration of how we got to No Child Left Behind and now Race to the Top, uh, but essentially there are two different schools of thought, and I'm just going to talk about both of them. Just as Governor Christie and Mayor Booker support the notion, the old dictum, that politics makes strange bedfellows, so does the Education Equality Project. Uh, Joel Klein and Al Sharpton, an unlikely duo. In fact, one morning I was watching uh, Meet the Press, and not only were they on representing the education equality project, but the third of the triumphant, Newt Gingrich. I mean, think about the unlikely project of those three supporting the same thing, I guess. There's hope. Uh, now, Klein and Sharpton founded a group called Education Equality Project that places the emphasis on the school level and at the most broad, the district level. That is, it argues that improvements in student achievement can be accomplished at the school level and that ultimately there are no excuses. This is a view that says that poverty, family dysfunction, etc. are not excuses for underachievement. That is, schools can solve the problem and to do that there are a number of things they have to do. Ensure an effective teacher in every classroom. Empower parents, create accountability. Make decisions about what is best for students. You can read that, I don't have to. And I would add to that, most importantly, and conspicuous by its absence, is what? Maybe the most important thing there. Look in the mirror and tell me the answer. Leadership by people like yourselves. That is every study over the last 30 years on in the effect of school literature has had at the top or near the top leadership by a principal or school head as vital to academic success and school success. <laughs> now on the other side of the equation and I will argue these aren't either ors at the end, are what you would call those who stress societal and community-based reforms. That is, that schools don't exist in a vacuum, they are part of larger communities, and that although poverty may not be an excuse, it is, in my words, an explanation. That is, and to say that it is doesn't mean that 
you're labeling poor kids or any children as incapable of learning, what you're saying is that they have challenges that come from things other than the school, things that you as administrators and your teachers don't control. Uh, and the main advocates of this approach have been, on the one hand, Gene Anion, who is a professor at CUNY Graduate Center, and Richard Rothstein, who's at the Education Policy Institute, who argue that you have to affect, you have to really understand and address things outside of schools. Rothstein, in a very good book, Class in Schools, shows the degree to which things like health care, health problems, environment, that is often children whose parents don't have the resources to send them to an eye doctor, can't see the board. Often if they don't go to a dentist, they're in intense pain and often teachers don't know it. Or if their family moves four times during two years, uh, it's hard to have any consistency. Now, there are one reform you've heard a lot about, Jeffrey Canada's Harlem Children's Zone, uh, and a new approach based upon that called a broader, bolder approach to education. The heads of that are Pedro Naguero at NYU and Helen Ladd at Duke. Uh, there's a application of this, the broader, bolder approach in Newark right now, called the Newark Global Village Zone, which is the Newark equivalent of the Harlem Children's Zone, which says that you must continue to focus on the school and the district, but at the same time you have to increase early childhood programs, increased investment in health services, and understand how st students spend their time, not just inside of school, but outside of school. Okay, let me begin, and let me just say that Governor Christie's educational reform agenda is not his alone. That is, that's a reform agenda that's coming from the federal level, from the top down. So all of the things here, with some exception, have been institutionalized in President Obama and Secretary Duncan's race to the top, uh, which as school administrators you will have to deal with, fortunately or unfortunately, in the way you've had to deal with No Child Left Behind since 2002. So what is, and I've taken this in part from John Mooney's uh, NJ Spotlight, which is a very good website. Uh, Governor Christie, as you know, has really seized the educational bully pulpit over the last two years to argue for a radically different way of educating in New Jersey and the nation. And that includes a number of things. I'm not going to talk about most of them today, although if you go on our IELP website, which is IELP.rutgers.edu, you'll see I gave a lecture at the New School uh, oh, a couple of weeks ago. I love the title, although my wife, who's also a professor of education, had a better title. My title was A Gift Horse Whose Facebook Deserves the Closest Scrutiny. Will Mark Zuckerberg's $100 million lead to the improvement of the Newark schools? Uh, my wife's subtitle, which was much better, was Beware of Geeks Bearing Gifts. <laughs> See, my, hers is much better. Uh, but I have a full PowerPoint that deals with the other things that I'm not going to talk about today, and it's available right on our website. So the governor is in favor of vouchers through the New Jersey Scholarship Act, which is now winding its way through the legislature, cutting school spending, which he has done $1.6 billion. Uh, you are all familiar with the fact that Justice Doyne, the special master, just ruled uh, in an important case that the $1.6 billion in cuts over two years 
violates the thorough and efficient clause of the New Jersey Constitution, sending it back for the 24th time, I think this will be Abbott 23 or 24, where the Supreme Court will have to decide whether or not this has violated the constitutionality of CIFRA, the School uh, Funding Reform Act of 2008. And the New York Times, in fact, today had a powerful editorial saying that the Supreme Court ought to do what's constitutionally correct, that is to affirm Justice Doyne's decision. Uh, if you go on to Brian Lear's uh, NPR website, there was a very, very good debate between my colleague Paul Trachtenberg and Steve Adubato Jr. on Tuesday morning, I believe, which you can get, which was a nice back and forth in which Adubato argued that a budget crisis trumps the Constitution, and Trachtenberg argued that the Constitution always trumps the budget, and that if it does, then the governor has to make some other decisions, like a millionaire's tax or something like that, uh, to make up for that budget deficit. Uh, Okay, so merit pay, which we're going to talk about today because it's very much a part of teacher evaluation and value-added models. Eliminating seniority uh, for last hired, first fired rules, which has become, if you watch, you know, the New York stations, which most of you probably get, uh, this ongoing advertising war between Mayor Bloomberg on the one hand, financed by Mayor Bloomberg the person, uh, and the teachers union about, and a group that actually Mayor Bloomberg funds, although you know he doesn't say that, uh, and is headed by Joel Klein, in which they show young teachers saying, we have to eliminate uh, last hired, first fired, it has to all be on merit, and what's left out, as we'll see, is I don't think anyone would disagree that merit ought to be part of it, even most union leaders privately. The question is, how do you get at merit? And that's one of the problems we'll talk about. Uh, expanding charter schools, which I'm not going to talk about, uh, but if you've been reading about what's going on in Newark, it's clearly, you know, a very hot issue with charter school parents and district school parents going to advisory board meetings and shouting each other down. I mean, the vitriol has become a weekly event. Now, Mayor Booker in Newark supports the expansion of charter schools and all of reforms in teacher evaluation and seniority-based layoffs. Prior to his first term, he also professed support. He was an open voucher supporter. He hasn't said anything since he became mayor, but it's reported he will testify in favor of the Scholarship Act. The newer context, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, it's been a state-operated district since 1995. In September, actually, Governor Christie delegates local control to Mayor Booker. Uh, at the same time that Zuckerberg gives $100 million, they announce it on the Oprah Winfrey show. Uh, three weeks before, Governor Christie terminated the contract of Superintendent Janey. Now there's a new a search for a new superintendent. Uh, $200 million makes for a lot of heat. Everyone is trying to get a piece of the money. Uh, so there's a lot going on right now, and it's in within this context, both locally in Newark and statewide, that the issue of teacher quality has really reached a crescendo. Okay, what are the value add, what are the teacher quality reforms? There are a number, I'm going to talk about two. The first are VAM, or value added models just when I thought I understood from my stepdaughter that Wham was a group that, what's his name? Now I forget his name. 
George Michael. I was going to say George Mitchell, but he's the Middle East. Shows why my brain is. Uh, yeah, that Wham was a group. Now we have VAM. Uh, that is value-added models of teacher evaluations to be used in tenure, promotion, dismissal, and merit pay. Uh, does everyone have some familiarity with what that means, a value-added model? What? Yeah. No, no, could you? Yeah, I mean, all, I mean, there are two different kinds of value-added models. One is for schools. And one of the major criticisms of No Child Left Behind is it didn't and still doesn't use value-added models to look at school ranking or AYP, putting schools in need of improvement. What No Child Left Behind did was it says you look at the objective scores for a school. What percent on the state tests are proficient? And by 2014, it's supposed to be 100%. So you either made it, that is, if you projected that in 2011, in a particular school, 70% of the students were going to be proficient, then you either, if you were at 69, you failed. High stakes test. If you were at 71, you're OK. Now, critics of that from the very beginning argued is that it discriminated against schools, low achieving schools with high poverty, both rural and urban. Because many of those schools began very low. So that if you were at a 30% proficiency rate, and by 2011 you're supposed to be at 70, if you make dramatic progress and you get up to 60%, that is, you 30% increase, you still fail. So the argument is that you need some balance in an algorithm between the objective and the value add. It's simply defined in terms of school the difference between where you are in a given year and where you are the next year. Now, the value added model can be equally problematic. So New York City initiated a school by school report card three years ago in which they created an algorithm that is a formula heavily weighted toward growth. And then they found themselves in the embarrassing position that a school that started out at 20% and went up to 35%, which is a nice growth, received an A. And a school that was at 95% and went down to 92% received an F. Now you try to tell parents that their children go to a school where 92% of the children are proficient, but it's a failing school. While at the same time, the school down the road has 35% proficient, but they're getting an A. So obviously, either one is problematic. You need a sophisticated, sensitive algorithm that can balance those things. And New York City is now trying to deal with that. Uh, the other teacher quality reform, and these are not just teacher quality, but because most of today is talking about evaluating teachers from the perspective of administrators, I didn't deal with administrative quality, but all of these same issues relate to the evaluation of administrators. That is, the difference is the value added model that's being proposed for teachers is based on what? Student achievement growth in a particular teacher's classroom. So the simple model is you begin with a pretest in September of each child in the classroom, and then at the end, the student has a post test. 
be it you know NJS or HESPA. Well, actually, they're not doing it at the high school level. That's another problem. And at the end, you use an algorithm to measure the growth in the classroom, and you can then know. And then, but it gets really more complicated. Did anyone read the article in the New York Times by Michael Weintrip a couple of weeks ago? about a teacher in New York City who's coming up for tenure. And it looks like based on this very, and they printed the equation. I mean, it's like this long, this, 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 this. And the model says that you are a successful or effective teacher if your students grow at a predicted rate now, or an acceptable predicted rate. Now, where does that predicted rate come from? How do you decide it? The equation. Whatever the equation spits out. So, turns out that she's a high school English teacher. 63 of her 64 students last year were proficient. The model said that they were supposed to grow by 0.18, and they grew by 0.09. So she gets an F, despite the fact that her children are proficient, because they, didn't, they grew, but they didn't grow enough. Now, if you think back to the last presentation, her principal has observed her numerous times, he says she's one of the best teachers in the school. He's recommending her for tenure. She's a career changer who went through the New York City Teaching Fellows Program. Precisely what, we'll see in a minute, what the reformers want. A degree from undergraduate University of Pennsylvania, graduate teachers college Columbia, left advertising to take a huge pay cut to become a new teacher. And two years later, despite the fact that her principal thinks she's outstanding, her students are learning as defined by proficiency, some very complicated econometric formula is saying she's a failure. And that it may be the case that the principal can't even argue that she, or convince anyone she should get tenure. So, <clears throat> as I will argue, these value-added models based on student achievement, they sound nice. I mean, you would all like to be able to use data from your school. Look at the teacher, look at the students, see if they've grown, identify where students are learning, and you know what? You can do all of those things. And you should. But whether or not those data should be used for high stakes decision making alone, based on student achievement tests that we know shouldn't be used. Every expert says that they shouldn't be used alone as a determinant of high stakes decision making and yet that's what's being proposed. Now as I will argue in a little while, Bruce Baker at the Graduate School of Education at Rutgers New Brunswick who's been in the paper a lot lately debating with Commissioner Cerf on these issues and he has a wonderful blog, which I'll put up there in a little while, called School Finance 101, has said, you know what? These value-added models, you might just take out a coin and flip one, because the margin of error is at least 50%. Well, would any one of us want our careers decided by a flip of a coin? Now, that's not to say that these models don't have promise. What it means is that they're in their infancy. And the new reformers, like Governor Christie, they, they don't have the patience to wait. That is, the train has left the station, the kids are failing, we have to do something. So that's the context. Now the other context are alternative teacher and administration models. Things like the New Teacher Project, founded by Michelle Rhee, uh, New Leaders for New Schools, uh, Teacher University, which is now, at least in New York State, where David Steiner, the commissioner, has said that 
organizations like TeacherU not related to universities can give certification and they are linked to Uncommon Schools. You would know Uncommon Schools is New Jersey as the operator of North Star Academy in Newark and the KIPP schools, which if you've seen Waiting for Superman, have a national reputation. Uh, that on the job training like New Jersey Alternate Route, the New Jersey New York City Teaching Fellows is superior to the traditional university route. And you know, the most famous or infamous example at the superintendent level is Kathy Black, who comes to New York City without ever being a student in a public school, having a kid in a pu public school, ever been an educator. Now, let me just say that I supported Joel Klein reluctantly when he was nominated uh, by, the, by Mayor Bloomberg in 2002. And the reason I did is that although he had no education experience, he had a distinguished career in public service that is working as a lawyer for the Justice Department. And I think it's very different, and we could debate this, about having administrative experience in government, albeit not in education, and experience in the business sector. Now the reason why someone like Kathy Black is so po popular to someone like Mayor Bloomberg is not only did they go to the same cocktail parties, uh, they also are both business executives and what's going on now over the last 10 years is anything related to business management is good and anything related to public sector management is seemingly bad. And I think that's a simple view. Okay, what does the research say? And I have put up, and this is, all of this is on the IELP website on the larger Zuckerberg thing. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the equations. Some of this stuff is really complicated. So I'll just summarize it. On merit pay, the most rigorous study of performance-based teacher comp compensation ever conducted at Peabody College at Vanderbilt University shows that a nationally watched bonus pay system had no overall impact on student achievement. That is, and this was a controlled experiment so that it was implemented in some districts and not in others. They used, you know, very complicated statistical methods to control for everything they could. And at the end of the day, they found no evidence that those districts that had merit pay for performance had any better, any more growth in student achievement than those who didn't. That's not to say that there shouldn't be a merit system. What it says is that if you're doing it to improve student achievement, the evidence so far is not strong. Second, the problems of using test scores to evaluate teachers. So that next website gives you a whole set of reasons why student test scores alone are not valid and reliable measures by which to evaluate teachers. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. There's a very, very readable piece without numbers by Wayne Au in Rethinking Schools website. And I'll summarize that in a moment in the next slide that looks at some of the problems with value added models. And Bruce Baker, who I've mentioned before, has this huge PowerPoint on his school finance blog that it's probably worth looking at only to see how complicated it is, but it's really well beyond most of our comprehension because it deals with all those equations. But it's an interesting piece and to summarize it, he argues that there's little evidence that value-added models can are sensitive enough 
to really isolate teacher effects. And finally, this last piece, which I'll talk a little bit about in the subsequent slide after Wayne Owes, by Jesse Rothstein, who's a economist at Berkeley. There's a website that's put out by the National Education Policy Center at the University of Colorado Boulder, which is an excellent source. And it's called the Think Tank Review website. And what they do, I just wrote one, I'll tell you an interesting story about it. I was asked to review by them a report by a group called the Lexington Institute. And they're called the Lexington Institute because they named themselves after the Battle of Lexington and Concord, so you can see their emphasis is liberty, so it's a kind of conservative libertarian organization. They issued this report called New Jersey Res Results. It was on the effects of the Abbott reforms, particularly in Newark. And the, what the Think Tank Review does is we have this whole new, brave new world of research. I mean, it used to be the case that when people like me, researchers, produced a research article, you'd send it to a journal, they'd send it out to three, which is still the case, to three peer reviewers who'd look at it and say, well, this is wrong and this is wrong, you need to fix this, you need to fix that, you use the wrong equation. And the plus side is that you'd get it right or it wouldn't get published. The downside is that is a long process so that journal articles sometimes don't appear for a year to two after they've actually been written and guess what, the data is now out of date. So now you have a whole lot of groups, particularly think tanks, foundations, commissioning reports, both liberal and conservative, and placing those reports without peer review on the websites and releasing them. And what NEPC does is say, well, that's good. It gets the word out. But what we're going to do is peer review them. That is, we're going to send them to at least one person who can then write a report saying whether or not it's accurate, et cetera. So I did one on this thing, and I, the report was just awful. I mean, it was completely, there was no evidence. There were no methods. It simply took all of the evidence from one report done by E3, uh, Excellent Education for Everyone, which is the statewide voucher advocacy group. Now, whether you are pro or con vouchers, to use that as your only source is highly problematic. And so I reviewed it and it went out at about 3 in the morning, they sent it out. And by 11, the director sends me an email saying, Governor Christie's office has just called demanding to know who they can talk to. They said, expect an email or a phone call. So I immediately, since I work for the State University of New Jersey, technically I work for him, uh, emailed it to my chancellor and said, heads up, and you might want to email it to President McCormick. Nothing came of it. I never received a phone call. But they look at this stuff. I mean, this is not, you know, once you put it out there, there's someone in the governor's office who every day it's a jo his or her job is to, to do searches on Education New Jersey, and that popped up. Uh, but Jesse Rothstein's is a very easily read, non-technical analysis of the Gates project, and I'll talk about that in a moment on teacher quality. Okay, what are the problems with VAM? Well, there's year-to-year -year test score instability. And if we had more time, I'd be asking you to tell me what these things are rather than me doing it. But since I have about 20 minutes left, I'm going to tell you. Uh, Value-added models are not able to get the variation from year to year. So David Berliner, one of the most respected educational psychologists in the country, the former dean of the Arizona State University School of Education, has written fairly widely on the fact that 
he has studied merit pay in a number of states and found that teachers who rank very highly in the merits pay and get a big merit pay one year, in the next year often are down at the bottom. Now why does that happen? For a variety of reasons, but I'll give you another example. When I first started teaching college, and I've been doing this, God, I don't even want to remember, 30 plus years, one of my first classes was as an adjunct at Fairleigh Dickinson. And I had two back-to-back -back classes, an introduction to sociology, one Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9, one day Monday, the other Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 10. And that was a time in my career when I not only wrote lesson plans, I wrote lectures. And quickly I understood that if you write lectures, you're going to lecture. So, you know, basically I started then writing plans and now I write outlines. Now I'm at a stage of my career that it's in here most of the time. Uh, but I couldn't understand it. The first class was going so well. You know, students were active, they were participating, they were, you know, all the things that Art was talking about, you know. I could see, or at least I thought learning was going on. And then, you know, the class would end, I'd go and I'd do the same thing in the next class, and it kept bombing. And I couldn't understand it. Said, I'm doing exactly the same thing with class two as I did with class one. Well, what was the problem? They were different students. And I was treating them like they were exactly the same. And when I stopped doing the same thing and I let their needs and interests come to the top, then that one turned out to be as good or better as the other one. So ultimately what the model is, these models are not sensitive enough to look at variations in classrooms. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Day-to-day -day score instability. Well, you test on, you know, one day and something could happen, the next day some crisis in the school happened. You just don't have enough. The conditions of testing are in fact variable. And therefore from year to year those scores may be variable. Well, I mean the most important things are this value-added models are really based on the assumption of experimental design. That is, they work best if you randomly assign students to teachers. And the statistical probability is that there will be a normal curve in every classroom. Well, that doesn't happen. And because it doesn't happen, the model isn't sensitive enough to the variations within or between classrooms. The measures are imprecise. Most importantly, it can't control adequately, even though they try, for outside of school factors. That is, the things that students bring to classrooms. For example, my wife teaches at the City College of New York in Harlem, where there is a sizable Dominican population. Well, every October or so, Dominican students in that neighborhood leave and they go back to the Dominican Republic. And they come back again sometime in March or April. Anyone know why? Maybe, but it's, it's, it's a simpler answer. I mean, the carnival wouldn't be six months or four months or whatever it is. Well, it, it's related to winter up here, but they go back and their families back in the Dominican Republic need their parents to come back and help. So they then get enrolled in school maybe in the Dominican Republic or they may work on the family farm and then they come back so they've missed a good portion of the middle of the semester. At the end, in April or May they take this exam <laughs> but the model doesn't unless you have a sophisticated model that 
uses controls for absences, which they should, but they don't often do. Uh, can none of those models can really control, you know, in Newark, a sizable minority of students at the high school level have gone through some form of trauma in their life. Trauma from family dysfunction, fa trauma from watching gang warfare in their neighborhood, trauma from moving three or four times because their parent or one parent has lost their job. You can't adequately control for those things. And if you can't, then it becomes very difficult to have a fair evaluation. Uh, politics, not reality. The fact is that so much of this is highly politicized that the ability to get a fair system is called into question. And finally, classroom composition and peer effects. We all know, as teachers or administrators of a classroom, you know, my late former therapist once gave me what I think is the great definition of a family. And I, sorry if I offend everyone, I've been certainly related to my family. He said, a family is a dysfunctional unit dominated by its sickest member. <laughs> now, we've all known as teachers or administrators a class dominated by its most problematic student or students. And all it takes is a couple to change the entire climate of the classroom. Now, if you're a really skilled teacher, you can probably recover. If you're a new teacher, if you don't know how to deal with that, your whole class can, in fact, be sabotaged. And, you know, a teacher will go, and if it's like you, a highly effective principal, try to figure out ways to handle this. But the fact is, those models cannot control. How can they control? There's no way to create a variable about peer effects. It's the most complicated thing to get at. And none of these models adequately do that. Now, <laughs> the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have sunk $48 million into something they call the Measures of Affecting Teacher Project. And they just released their first report based on a pilot. Their findings and in every grade and subject, the teacher's past record of value added is among the strongest predictive of student achievement gaps in other. So if you have value added in your class in the third grade, then the value added model will show that the kids you taught in the third grade continue to grow in the fourth, fifth, sixth grades. I mean, that's the, there's a lot, the Ed Trust has put out a lot of things saying that a highly effective teacher can, in fact, reduce the achievement gap by 40% over a period of years. I don't know where they get those numbers, but some of it is based on these assumptions. Although this is based on data, not just assumptions. Teachers with high value added on state tests tend to promote deeper conceptual understanding some of this was based on observation. A lot of it was based on student interviews. Uh, teachers have larger effect on math achievement than on achievement in reading or language arts. That's, some of that is confirmed in New Jersey. Uh, and the last student perceptions of a given teacher's strengths and weaknesses are consistent across the different groups of students they teach. Students seem to know effective teaching when they experience it. Is that true? I mean, Art, you think it's true. Uh, at the college level, I don't know how true it is. All you have to do is go on, rate your professor <laughs> to see what you get on rate, prof rate your professor because it's not scientific. That is, you, you get a very bimodal distribution. All the people who love the professor, all the people who hate the professor. Nothing in the middle. 
It's like Fox News. I mean, why would you call in to say that you hate President Obama or MSNBC? Why is it that you love President Obama? The fact is, most of the people who watch those have one or the other political persuasion, so it's a what we would call a biased selection, or it suffers from selection bias. The other thing I found in my career, both as a department chair and a dean, is that at least at the college level, teacher evaluations handicap female instructors much more than male instructors. Does that seem plausible? I'll give you an example. If you take stereotypical gender roles, men as intellectual, smart, commanding, now, I'm not saying these are true. What I'm saying is they're stereotypical gender roles. Women as caring, collaborative, etc. Then, if you're, what I found is that male instructors can have it both ways. That is, if they are strong, intellectual, commanding, students generally love them. If they are caring, collaborative, supportive, students love them. That is, they are the father that they never had. I wish my father had been so caring, etc. Female professors, on the other hand, when they're caring, collaborative, etc., are really well liked and loved because they're acting in gender role. When they're tough, commanding, etc., students are much less likely to give them high ratings. And there's a word that begins with a B that often comes out on the teacher evaluations. Well, no one ever called me a B word. The fact is that surveys measure bias. That is, so perceptions ought to be taken into account. You're right. If, you know, I once observed a faculty member who got his PhD in the Netherlands, where it's a straight lecture system. And I observed him, and we had a pre-conference, and I sat there, and I watched a group. He had about 60 students in the class, and he was teaching like a no-brainer. That is something called Paths to Maturity. It was this core course for college freshmen and sophomores on adolescence. Like, hello, if there was ever a course you could connect with students, and I watch him for an hour and a half standing there at the podium in the most drone, just, you know, and I'm watching the classroom, and this was before texting. If, <laughs> if there had been texting, they would have been, I see students with their head down, I see them like looking up, I was falling asleep. So afterwards, I same thing. How do you feel this went? Oh, I think it went very well. Well, based upon what? Well, I thought it was a very organized. I said, did you ever look out at your students? <laughs> Three quarters of them were dead, and the other quarter were praying to be dead. <laughs> and you have no idea. Well, that's not my role. My role is to give them the knowledge. It's up to them to take it. Well, a very different view. Now. I've been known, and probably you can see, I could keep you probably thinking, entertained, et cetera, till about 5 o'clock and never let you say anything. And I wouldn't put most of you to sleep because I think I'm a pretty good lecturer. But the fact is, I would have no way of knowing whether or not you learned anything. You know, when I first, that first semester at FDU, teaching this class, and it was this great class. Students are engaged and they're laughing and we're going back and forth and I walk out and I get into my car and I say, that was great. And then I had this pedagogical epiphany. As young as I was, I was wise, <laughs> he says in retrospect. I said, yeah, they had fun, but did they learn anything? Because if all they were, if all I was doing was entertaining them, you know, I should go at, to the comedy club and become George Carlin. 
The fact is, if their engagement translated into learning, if they knew exactly what I was trying to get them to think about, then I was being successful. So ultimately, you need a way to, and often students, particularly at the college level and probably at the high school level, you know, if you ask, I ask my college students, looking back, think about who, which teachers at the high school level did you like the most? And which ones did you dislike the most then? And in retrospect, how do you view them now? And although there was some consistency, they always say, you know, the ones that I really didn't like because they were really tough. And I didn't like them very much. And now I look back and I say I learned the most from them because they didn't let me get away with anything. They demanded excellence. And the ones that I loved, looking back, I loved them because they didn't demand very much of me. That is, we came in and la la la, and it was fun, but in retrospect, I wish I had learned more. Now, that's not to suggest student perceptions aren't important. What it suggests is that they have to be understood in the context of what they're telling you. And surveys are one way, but they're limited. So we need to go deeper. Okay, I gotta move forward. Rothstein argues that while the report's conclusion that teachers who perform well on one measure tend to do well on the other is technically correct, that is on different measures of the evaluation, the tendency is shockingly weak. That is, there's really not a whole lot of evidence that this model works. For 48 million, it better work better. <clears throat> And that the report's main conclusion that a teacher's past track record of value added is among the strongest predictors of their student achievement gains in other classes and other academic years is not supported by the underlying analysis. And he goes on to say what you would need, they don't do. Okay, I'm going to skip over some of this because we're running out of time. Uh, what these talk about is the need that teacher experience does matter. That is, you know, much of the debate about using value added for teacher evaluations, particularly in terms of seniority layoffs, is that there are this huge number of experienced tenured teachers who are basically dead weight, incompetent, should be removed immediately, and that if we lay off, and that there are these incredibly talented young teachers who if we don't use merit are going to lose their jobs and we're going to be kept with, you know, the dead weight. Now, from your experiences, how accurate is that? Oversimplistic? Yeah, I mean, there are excellent teachers who are experienced. There are excellent new teachers. There are mediocre of both. The only thing about those who are untenured is that you're in a position to ensure that they don't get tenure. You know, when I talk to our principal candidates, I ask them the following question in our interview for admission. I say you have a teacher coming up for tenure who's been really weak in the first year. In the second year you work with this teacher and he or she improves. In the third year he or she improves again. And then you have to recommend for or against tenure and at the end you look at it and you say well this teacher has demonstrated improvement but after three years I don't believe that teacher is at the level for me, is not at the level of what I consider to be competent. May get there, but is not competent. What do you do? What do you do? Pull a plug. I mean, I, an assistant superintendent once told me, when in doubt, out. In all the years that I was a chair and a dean in a teacher education program, 
And the student came in crying at the eight-week mark when they were on probation. Oh, please give me another eight weeks. Probably in 1% of the time when I decided to give them another eight weeks, it turned around. That is, you know, you either, you know, pull the tooth now or have to pull three teeth later and go to the lawyer. But the fact is that the notion that experience doesn't matter is ludicrous. All the work on the difference between novice and expert teaching over the year by Lee Shulman suggests that it takes between five and seven years to really become an expert. And yet, we've devalued that. And I think we have to remember. Now, I believe, and this is a hot topic, I believe that the tenure, do I believe in tenure? Yes, but. And the big but is that we give public school teachers tenure much too quickly. Three years? If it takes seven to be an expert, why in the world would you give someone tenure, you know, after, is it what, in your, after two years? Three. 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 So you become tenured in your First four. Day, your four. Yeah. I mean, the university model is six years. You come up in your sixth year, you either get it, and if you don't get it, you have one extra year, the seventh, to find another job, or you're tenured. Uh, to me, a much more reasonable period. And I think the university model is superior because at least at places like Rutgers, it's more collaborative. That is, administrators are the second level. That is, faculty committees review candidates very carefully, and it's not a rubber stamp, at least at most research universities. If we don't believe someone deserves to be our colleague for life, then we regularly say no, which then means the administration doesn't become the bad person. The faculty takes responsibility, and then the administration is the next level, and sometimes they agree and sometimes they disagree. But it's a much more careful process, I think, and we could benefit from that kind of process. Now, Bruce Baker, again, argues that there's a circular logic. The evidence doesn't support what the reformers want. Just very quickly on alternative teacher and principal education, no conclusive evidence that alternatives produce better student outcomes than traditional. Uh, or vice versa. Now, what's amazing to me is New Jersey has one of the oldest alternate route programs in the country since the early 1980s and has never commissioned a longitudinal study comparing retention rates, tenure rates, never mind student achievement rates of alternate route versus traditional route. Uh, no other profession permits practitioners to enter without training and licensure. The idea that you can, in fact, become a surgeon over the summer. Uh, now, I'm not equating being a teacher with, in terms of the knowledge of highly technical, you know, and I, you know, your kid fail, your student fails, okay, they get another year. My cardiologist cuts the wrong thing, that's it, no second chances. But you know, there's a lot of evidence to say it's more complicated. Okay, I'm going to run through this really quickly. Given all of this, and what I've argued is that there are, not that we shouldn't use value added. We shouldn't, not that we shouldn't have more effective teacher evaluation. Not that we should accept tenure and last hired, first fired as sacrosanct. Far be it, we need systematic reform in all of these areas. But what I'm arguing is that what is being recommended is not supported by the evidence, is happening too quickly. It puts all of you in really difficult positions. And that if we want to improve schools and districts, we need to do things far more systematically. 
and I'm going to just let you look at some of those things. They're on our website. Uh, and let me just, you know, the conclusion for all of this is that we need better research. Not the only thing, but the research is very limited, at least on the things I've talked about today. We should not abandon the best part of No Child Left Behind. That is what No Child Left Behind, its most positive, was the disaggregation of test scores. What it said is that affluent districts could no longer hide behind the 80% of affluent kids were up here and that the average then hid the other kids. And that if districts and schools were serving some children poorly like ELL or special education, they should be held accountable. So that part we should keep. We need to revise it with much better measures. Uh, we need to emphasize not just equality of outcomes, but of inputs. That is, all children have to have equal opportunities to learn. And that includes the fact that when poor kids get to kindergarten, they have significantly fewer words than middle class kids. And they continue to fall behind. We need ways to address those. We need to emphasize building capacities in schools and districts so that we can help schools and districts improve. We need to look not just at what goes on in schools and districts, but what goes on outside of them as well. And I've just cited uh, a book that a number of us did a number of years ago on No Child Left Behind that I think is useful. So on that note, thank you very much. If you want to contact me, that's where I can be reached. Alan, thank you very much. And if anyone, I know we've run out of time. If anyone wants to come up and ask me questions, I'd be more than happy to Just stay. one quick. Um, how can we get your PowerPoint? It's, if you go to, well, you know what? I'm going to post this one separately. So if you go to http colon backslash backslash ielp dot rutgers dot edu. I will post this on the Institute on Education Law and Policy website by tomorrow. Okay. So you'll be able to go and it'll say uh, PSA or FEA Legal One uh, PowerPoint. And that was loaded on our... Yeah, I can save it right here if oh, you want. Uh, what I'll do is I'll put all of the PowerPoints uh, that we had today on the FEA training.org website. If you go on featraining.org, it's part of the PSA website. Uh, there's a section called Resources. Click on that, and I'll load all of the uh, PowerPoints uh, that we looked at uh, today so that you have uh, the ones we used this morning and uh, ours as well. I just put it on the desktop of this, so you'll on be able desktop, to see it. That'll be fine. Yeah. Then I can yeah. take it from there. Uh, Art, thank you for uh, stimulating. Uh, people, feel afternoon. free to use anything I gave you within your district. And if you want more help thinking about some of that stuff in your district, contact Jay. And uh, Jay can arrange. I'm working uh, uh, with a number of school districts, uh, including moves on special learning communities. And uh, my thanks to all of you. It's been Glad a long day. I uh, hope you learned a lot. Uh, please come back and see us again. We've had a lot of activity here. We'd like to see you again.